Hello YouTube and welcome to an all new Elder Scrolls lore video. Today we'll mainly be talking about the races that inhabit the mysterious and enigmatic continent of Akavir. Akavir has been the face of many mysteries all across the Elder Scrolls lore, and although not much is known about the races of Akavir, I'll try to cover all of the information that we have regarding them and their respective nations in this video. And since I already talked about the Sacy a little bit, I invited my friend Mr. Sith to talk about them in this video, so he'll be making an appearance in this video, be sure to check him out if you like what he does. Before we begin, it's crucial for me to elaborate upon the role that Akavir plays in the Elder Scrolls lore. The name Akavir translates directly into Dragonland in several languages in the Elder Scrolls universe. The continent itself is a large landmass located just across the Padomaic Ocean, east of Tamriel. We don't exactly see the geography of the continent in any of the games, so we don't know what the continent looks like. So what you'll see in this video is almost all fan interpretations, especially when it comes to maps. Since Akavir is a place that we haven't really been yet in any of the games and I personally don't really think that we'll be going there anytime in the future so we're just relying on descriptions that we have in the lore here. Anyway, both the races of Tamriel and Akavir have attempted to invade each other at several points through history and one could say that there are centuries of conflict between the races of the two continents. Yet much of what we know about these invading forces from Akavir is either incomplete in the lore or it's all forgotten by our playtimes. Now I'm saying this because of the fact that the inhabitants of Tamriel have little to no evidence of the true physical and mental characteristics of the races of Akavir, even though they were on Tamriel and they invaded Tamriel and some of them even lived on Tamriel for years. However, by our playtimes, almost all of the proof of their existence on Tamriel is wiped out by the course of history, although we do know a little bit of their appearance, as there are still Akaviri relics of the past on Tamriel, such as the Dragon Guard temples that are still left standing well into the fourth era, but we'll get into that later into the video. In addition to all that, only a very small amount of people on Tamriel have ever even dared to cross the Panomaic Ocean to visit Akavir itself, and this is most likely due to the stories that people heard regarding all of the races that inhabit it, as they mostly seem pretty fearsome. The last person that we know of that at least attempted to make the trip was the Nurevereen, the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's hero, and this was done after the defeat of Dagoth Ur in the Third Era. Another thing to note in terms of the aversion that mankind in particular has towards the continent of Akavir is the fact that it's believed that men used to live there, but that they were eaten by a rivaling race called the Sesi, which completely eradicated the presence of mankind on Akavir alone. Now the term eaten here should be taken with a really big grain of salt because it could mean anything from actually being eaten to other implications like them being enslaved or assimilated into the race. Because we know that Sacy, who came to Tamriel at some point, can actually procreate with mankind. So we don't actually know how this the Sacy eating the men of Akavir actually happened. And there's also a little bit of a doubt whether the men of Akavir were actually a thing or whether they were just a legend, or maybe the Sacy were the men of Akavir. But that's all speculation and left vague in the lore. What we do know, however, is that it's very unlikely that there's actually still men on Akavir, so humans on Akavir. We know for a fact that goblins were also spotted on Akavir and that their fate was similar to that of man, but goblins were predominantly enslaved and used for their blood on Akavir. As far as we know, elves on the other hand are never really a defining colony on the continent of Akavir and we never hear anything about it. Although if you watch my video on the Sacy, you'll see that I have a theory on their possible influence on Akavir, but you'll have to watch that uh, because the Sacy is Mr. Sith's territory here in this video. Now moving on, we do know that there were five races that we're actually sure of that lived on Akavir at some point in the past. But as of the fourth era, it said that only four dominant races now make up the population of the continent, as one of them was actually wiped out. This is not counting the humans of Akavir, which are still in the very much in the realm of speculation. We don't know exactly what their status is, as I said before. 
Now it's very possible of course that there could be other races of intelligent creatures on Akavir, mainly because some of the earlier documented encounters that the inhabitants of Tamriel had with Akavir suggest that they've seen people with rat-like features and other with canine features, a bit like the Khajiit wandering around the continent, but we never really get elaboration on those races in the lore and we don't even know whether they were real or just something that the early explorers made up. Regardless, the ones that we do know exist are the main leading races of the four nations currently that we know of occupying the continent of Akavir. The fifth race that used to inhabit Akavir were the dragons and they're all gone from Akavir as far as we know. Now the interesting thing here is that we know that Akavir is called the Dragonland because dragons used to be indigenous to the continent. But now they're all gone and this part of the lore is a bit weird and a bit contradictory as some sources state that the Seisi enslaved a lot of them and consumed a lot of them and some dragons also fled to other regions in Akavir, such as Potun, which we'll talk about later. And that even other dragons just completely fled the continent and migrated to either Atmora or Tamriel. And this is all supposed to be taking place during the very earliest stages of the Meretic Era. So that's how continents like Atmora and Tamriel ended up with a dragon population, according to legends. But we don't really have any non-shaky sources on this subject. This could mean multiple things, but what we know surely is that the Seisi put up such a fight that they essentially forced the dragons off the continent altogether. And this brings me to the next race that we need to explain, the Seisi. And as, as I've already said before, I made a video on the Seisi myself at some point. So I'm not going to talk about it again on the channel, of course. So that's why I'll have my buddy Sith, who also has his own Elder Scrolls lore channel, Take it from here and give me his take on the Seisi. The Seisi are a race of vampiric serpent-like folk who have contradicting claims about their appearance. Their appearance has been described as many things, some claiming they are completely human or even snake-like, and others saying that they possess physical attributes of both men and snakes, which would mean they have a human upper body and serpentine lower body extremities. A certain theory even goes into the topic of them being shapeshifters, which might make more sense later in this discussion. They are also very adept at harnessing magic and utilizing it effectively, also utilizing a form of special magic called Kiai, which are similar to shouts from the Nordic Thum. After thriving untouched from outer forces for thousands of years on Ekavir, the Seisi decided to invade Tamriel in the year 2703 of the First Era. The beginning steps of their invasion proved to be very successful, managing to steamroll through the northern part of Tamriel and its defending forces, eventually reaching the Jeral Mountains near Bruma. This success was short-lived as Remen I, the new general and emperor of the Cyrdelic Empire, rose to take on the threat that the Akaviri invaders posed. He managed to rally the Kolovian and Nibine armies in order to properly face the invaders, and this all culminated in the Battle of Pale Pass, where he managed to corner the invading Seisi forces, cutting off their supply lines. This led some of them to flee back to Akavir, with the remaining forces pledging their loyalty to Remen I upon witnessing the power of his doom. These remaining Seisi forces were granted amnesty by Remen I and they slowly bred into imperial families and society. And even to this day, Seisi heritage and surnames are a form of pride amongst imperial nobility. After the Battle of Pale Pass, Remen's empire expanded at a rapid rate, growing into an economic and militaristic superpower. And most of this rapid expansion and success is attributed to the military prowess of the Seisi forces that pledged their loyalty to the Second Empire. Their influence was imprinted in nearly every aspect of imperial culture and their institutions. With the most important reforms being the creation of the Akavir Dragon Guard as the Emperor's personal guard, and the appropriation of the dragon symbol as the image of the Empire. Another interesting development imperial society made under the Seisi was the founding of the Fighters Guild. A Seisi warrior named Daenerys Vess was responsible for bringing up the idea to the Seisi potentate in charge of the Imperial Throne after Remen's lineage failed in the year 320 of the Second Era, and this idea was proposed in response to the financial bankruptcy and rapid economic decline the Second Empire had suffered after the death of Remen's last successor. The Seisi potentate in question was Versidi Ushe, and before his time as a potentate, he served as Remen III's advisor. 
It is believed that Versidu secretly plotted to assassinate Remen's lineage and all of Remen III's successors either died through battle or by hired assassins, leaving him without an heir and eventually dead. This is where Versidu stepped in as a potentate, ruling for over 300 years until the year 324 of the Second Era. Versidu was one of the few who was described as a serpent man, someone who had possessed physical attributes of both man and snake, but this can't be confirmed. Versidu and his son were reported to have moved like eels, in a slithering motion, giving us a different potential outlook, but even then these reports might not be true. His son Savir and Chorak, who succeeded him, ruled for another 100 years before he was assassinated and the Elder Council appointed someone of imperial descent shortly after. When the line of Akavir potentates failed in the year 430 of the Second Era, most of the Seisti fled from Cyrodiil and they joined other Akavir settlements in Rimen elsewhere. These would be known as Rim Men. After this exodus, the Seisi's presence in Sirdu started to quickly dwindle, and they generally disappeared from any prominent historical records. That is, until centuries later, when one of Tiber Septim's successors, Uriel V from the Septim Empire, managed to stabilize his empire and decided to look beyond Tamriel. He launched an invasion on Akavir, specifically on the isles between Tamriel and Akavir in the Padomaic Ocean, and then eventually on the southeastern part of mainland Akavir. The southeastern Akavir coast was home to the kingdom of the Seisi, and this is where they landed. They initially found success during the first quarter of this invasion, capturing settlements they would name Septimia and Ionith, but this was mainly due to the poor resistance that the Seisi showed in the beginning. Once Seisi armies and mages actually armed themselves and communicated in response to this threat, the imperial armies were quickly routed back to the coast in what would be called the Battle of Ionith in the year 290 of the Third Era. This led to the loss of at least one legion, with four others being captured, and it left Emperor Uriel V dead or enslaved. Only one imperial naval fleet successfully managed to extract the others and sail to the Padomaic Ocean back to Tamriel, and we're not really sure what led to such a swift defeat. Some attribute it to the fact that they had far more advanced arts of combat, both magical and physical. And this might have been true due to the rumors that speak of how powerful Seisi mages actually are. Now moving on, all of this brings me back to their origins and what race they truly are, and there are a couple of theories that are floating around the community about the true origins of the Seisi. Now they are as follows. That the Seisi are entirely human and are just advanced in terms of engineering and power. This is somewhat supported by the creation of the Skyhaven Temple during the Seisi's invasion of Tamriel, and how Alduin's wall within the temple depicts them as men and kneeling before a dragonborn. A report of Uriel V's invasion also describes the defending Seisi forces as mounted men, with no mention of any snake-like attributes. Theory 2 states that the actual Seisi are entirely snakes and that they've used the enslaved men on Akavir as the main forces of their armies, with only the high-ranking officers being Seisi snakes who control the bulk of their humanoid armies. Keep in mind that the Seisi are notorious for keeping slaves such as goblins and lesser creatures. Regardless, this would have allowed for both the snake overlords and human forces to be categorized as Seisi, leaving room for the human forces to easily assimilate into imperial society. It would also give Give more reason for Rem and Cyrdil's amnesty toward the invading Seisi army by the end of the first invasion. Beside their approval of his tomb, maybe he wanted to rid the human Akavir forces of their Seisi snake masters, we'll never truly know. One thing to note, however, is that some Seisi officers captured at Pale Pass were still reported as human, so take it as you will. Theory 3 states that there are two separate races on the territories of Akavir, human and the vampiric serpent-like beast folk and that these two coexisted amongst each other. This theory believes that the Seisi men are the ones that undertook the conquest to invade Tamriel in the first era, and that they were predominantly the ones that centered their culture around dragon slaying and prophecies. There's a reason why they knew that Rem and Cyrdiil was a dragonborn, even if they've been isolated on their own continent for centuries, and I bet it's an indicator that they knew far more than Tamriel's society did. 
I also won't rule out the possibility that they could have bred with the snake folk and that's why we see figures like the Sacy potentate versus Duche, who's believed to have been someone with the upper extremities of a human and lower extremities of a serpent. Now the last theory I've heard delves into the shapeshifter topic I mentioned earlier in the video and basically there are claims that the Sacy are in fact only one race of vampiric serpent creatures who have the ability to shapeshift into humans or other forms. Now this might be a bit far-fetched but it does explain why they could have masqueraded as men for such a while in hopes to successfully assimilate into the empire and take it over via a Sacy potentate. As we know, a Sacy potentate did take over the reins of the second empire for a while, but the rumors about his anatomy are incredible so we can't know for sure if the potentate was a serpent through and through. One thing I'm sure we can all agree on is that they seem to have originated from the wandering Elnofe, which might explain why every encounter that the people of Tamriel had with the Sacy has shown that they're humanoid in nature and that they even possess the ability to wield weapons and wear armor. Another interesting thing to note before we move on to the next race in line is that during the Elder Scrolls Online in the region of Stonefalls, there's a certain quest which has you bless the bones of the people who died because of a second Akavir invasion. And the quest reward is an item which reads, these gauntlets were designed to choke the scaled throats of the Akaviri invaders. One specific veteran called Fedrasa Andrethi of the aforementioned invasion is also absolutely terrified of anything reptilian since the war. Other NPCs related to the invasion often also refer to the invaders as the snakes and snake men, even though the invaders of the second Akavir invasion were predominantly from the Kamal race. The remaining Sasi from the Rimmin settlement and elsewhere only joined the surviving Kamal forces later after the defeat in Morrowind, so it seems that they were either Sasi forces with the Kamal at the beginning of the second invasion, or I've just found an oversight on Bethesda's part. Now after hearing all of these theories, tell me which one you think is most likely true. Thank you Mr. Sith, and as you all heard, there's quite a bit of information on the Sasi that we can say and that we can speculate about. Uh, but the other races of Akafir are far less in terms of the information that we know about them, so the next parts are going to be a bit shorter. So next in line is Kamal, and Kamal is not just the name of a country or a race, no, it's the name of both. Both the nation and the race inhabiting said nation is called Kamal. The creatures that make up this race are described as primal snow demons who live in the region of Kamal, which translates to snow hell. Once per year it's said that this race gets out of their own region and then proceeds to terrorize all the other inhabitants and regions of Akavir. But their target of choice is usually the Tang Mo, which is a race of monkeys which we'll talk about in a bit. Now this of course makes them all sound pretty dumb like wild animals, but they're not. They're an intelligent race because a notable event that the Kamal instigated was the second Akaviri invasion of Tamriel. And it was a pretty bold attempt at terrorizing Tamriel. Their demonic warlord and king at the time, called Adasum Dir Kamal, attempted to spearhead an invasion and landed his ships on the amount of the White River, north of Windhelm, in the year 572 of the Second Era. King Dir Kamal led his armies through the Sea of Ghosts, past Morwind and other islands surrounding it, making this a pretty unexpected visit for the Nords of Skyrim. And the Nordic population and their royalty were obviously caught off guard, as the fleet of Kamal warships arrived to completely obliterate them. Dir Kamal's offensive resulted in the sacking of Windhelm, with the Palace of Kings being left intact, yet still heavily damaged. As the city of Windhelm was sacked, the royal family that ruled over it suffered a gruesome fate, leaving the queen and her daughter dead. It seemed grim, but the hope was not lost, for a certain Nord hero called Joran the Skald King, who was related to the, to the deceased queen, was still alive and ready for a fight. While the Kamal forces moved southward towards Riften, Joran managed to rally the armies of Eastmarch and the Rift in order to defend the city of Riften from further sacking. And this is where the tide started turning in the war. Not only did Joran amass an army to defend Riften, but he also had the Greybeard summon Wolfhart the Ass King from Sovngarde, who would, become, who would become the deciding factor in the defense of Riften and subsequently Skyrim. Joran and his armies managed to defend off the attacking Kamal troops, leading to Deir Kamal to reroute his troops to Morrowind. But Joran didn't stop at the borders of Skyrim and simply followed the Kamal into Morrowind, hoping to finish them off completely. King Deir Kamal attempted to invade the northern region of Stonefalls in Morrowind, and this is where he first came into contact with the Tribunal. Meanwhile, not far behind his armies were the Nordic armies with Wolfhart and Joran, and coming to the aid of both the Nords and the Dunmer were Argonian Shellbacks. 
This really unusual alliance of the Nords, the Dunmer and the Argonians, three races who were usually just at each other's throat against a common enemy, resulted in the defeat of the Kamal and their king, who was killed at the Red Mountain by Omalexia and Wolfharth. Although this invasion was somewhat of a failure, Deer Kamal is still remembered as the most famous member of the Kamal race, and many of the surviving Kamal soldiers eventually joined the surviving Sesi in the settlement of Rimen and elsewhere after his death. Unfortunately, they and the most of the remaining Sesi in Rimen would eventually all be killed as they tried to start a war in Cyrodiil to get rid of the Emperor at the time, a pretender emperor named Atribus, who had branded all the Akaviri races outlaws since he opposed foreigners in Cyrodiil. The remaining Kamal and Sesi attempted to get rid of him in an invasion, but unsuccessfully, leading to almost all of them being killed in their attempts by the Empire at the time. Now, moving on, let's talk about the Kapotun. The nation of Kapotun, which translates to Tiger Dragon Empire, was formerly known as Potun, and the race of this nation also goes by the same name. They're a race of tiger-like catfolk, who are rumored to be in similar anatomy to the Khajiit. This race has never attempted to invade Tamriel, but they're at constant odds with the Sesi and consider them their greatest enemy. The dragons of Nurn also have a history with this tiger-like race, because even though a lot of the dragons in Akavir either s fled the continent or were enslaved or killed by the Sesi, some dragons managed to flee to the province of Potun, and the dragons that fled to Potun somehow got caught in the war between the Potun and the Sesi, and they were all eventually killed apparently. This war left both the Sesi and the Potun in an immensely weakened state. And ever since then the Potun have adamantly attempted to turn themselves into dragons. The reason for this desire to turn themselves into dragons might be linked to their possible admiration of the dragons. Or they may be just in pursuit of their great power. As they probably witnessed the great power of dragons during, during the war. Regardless of their intentions, rumor has it that a divine being and their leader called Toshraka eventually succeeded at actually transforming himself into a large orange and black dragon. Some parties believe that this is purely metaphorical, but the book Mysterious Akaviri claims that the changes were actually physical and that he has all the traits of a dragon. Apparently he got crowned to king of the race and following his coronation he renamed the race and the nation from the Potun to the Kapotun in, a, in an effort to rise above the Sesi Empire and ushered in a new era for his people. It's said that Toshraka's rise to power made the nation of Kapotun the most powerful empire on Akavir, even more so than the Sesi Empire. Some sources even state that they've allied themselves with the Tengmo race, one of the other races of Akavir, in order to further strengthen their power. Toshraka's goals are as of now to obliterate the Sesi and eventually launch a full-scale invasion on Tamriel, but we'll see if that ever comes to fruition. Would be fun if we see that in Elder Scrolls 6, wouldn't it? Lastly, we have the Tengmo race of Akavir. They are viewed as a race of generous and kind monkey people who inhabit the thousand monkey isles of Akavir. There are various breeds of Tengmo, and every breed is known for their multiple behavioral traits such as bravery, simplicity, and some are believed to be completely nuts, completely insane. They tend to largely keep to themselves and their, and their own islands, not really instigating or invading any surrounding territories. Although somewhat peaceful, the Tengmo are capable of gathering their armies in times of need and have always defended their islands successfully, even if they're at the constant threat of being captured for slavery by the other nations of Akavir. The Kamal in particular have had many altercations with the Tengmo, but it never really goes in favor for the, Teng uh, for the Kamal as the Tengmo manage to repel them each year. However, the Tengmo have been making strides in terms of allies recently, as I've said before, there's a rumor that they've allied themselves with their former enemies in the Kapotun. In conclusion, I think we can agree that the continent of Akavir is home to some several weird and interesting races, basically just as, as Tamriel. But even then, we know little to nothing about the true power that each of these races possesses as collective nations, or what their nation structures are, or, you know, what their intentions towards Tamriel are. We know a little bit, but not much. We don't even know if there's maybe even more intelligent races, but hey, it's another continent we've never been to, so it's unlikely that we'll ever find out. Perhaps the Elder Scrolls 6 or, you know, maybe Elder Scrolls Online after they've covered basically all of Tamriel might shed some more light on the races of Akavir and allow us to see how they fare through the centuries so that we compare them to the provinces and nations of Tamriel. It's definitely interesting to see how their societies function, and I wish we had more information regarding the aspects, but 
we don't, unfortunately. Anyway, if you're interested in checking out another Elder Scrolls lore channel with videos that you've probably not seen before, check out Mr. Stith's channel. I'm gonna let him speak now for a bit to plug himself. Hi, my name is Xith and thank you for tuning into this collaboration. I make similar content on my channel so I would urge you to go over there and visit. I am close to 1000 subscribers, so any type of support would be greatly appreciated. Thank you Mr. Z. As said before, the link to his channel is in the description, he also makes Elder Scrolls lore content. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, consider returning for the next Elder Scrolls lore video. I make them almost every week. And um, yeah, before I end things, allow me to vocally mention my top Patreon supporters who make all these videos possible. Mr. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Athena Hyotis, Polarized Poutine, Tsar Mikhail, Sword of Bushido and Mr. Christmas. These amazing people along with all the others on screen keep this channel alive and for that I am very grateful. That said, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.